So I'm going to have uh, Doug and Rick come on up here and uh, share quick stories as they come up. Turn to Proverbs 24 as they come on up. And as they come up, uh, let's go ahead and pray. So Lord, we do thank you for what you're doing at Harvest Church. We're, it's so fun to watch the kids have a good time and celebrate and uh, just be together in the snow, Lord. And, and, and as men and as women gather, as we gather as couples and as family, Lord, we just, we're, we're thankful for your presence in our midst. And uh, so we want to invite more people into that, Lord. And so if people are here and they haven't been a part of small group stuff, whether it's men's or youth or family stuff, we just pray, God, that you would uh, tap on their hearts and invite them by your spirit into these things, Lord. So bless us as we uh, hear the testimonies, as we open up your words, we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on up here, Rick. So this is Rick, better known, uh, also known as the coffee guy. And uh, so Rick actually <laughs> makes coffee. He's here before anybody else, I think. Uh, probably, like, I think he gets here at 3 a.m. on Sunday mornings to make coffee. Or yeah. maybe it just feels like that. You want, would you like this microphone? Is that what you want me to do? I'm thinking about giving I you know this. You know it's a... <laughs> because you're worried about what I'm Say, so yeah, I get here at six in the morning. There we I go. Throw my sack on. I climb up the hill. I pick the beans. I bring them back down. I roast them. <laughs> <laughs> I brew the coffee and I get it all set out so that the worship team can have some coffee in the morning. You too, had so. no idea what goes into that <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so M6. Oh my gosh, you guys! I heard about it the first two times, and the third time, I went. I want to do this. And I was going through a tough time with my dad, so I really didn't have any extra time for one more thing on my plate, and. I, but I don't know, God tickled my ears, so I thought, oh, I'm going to go check it out. I got there an hour early just to kind of see if I wanted to cash out of there. And I had an M6, what is this M6 thing? It was really strange. But. So I was searching for something in the first place before I got to this church, and I found this scripture-taught church with the most amazing man that just gets the word across to us, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't eliminate anything. It's what I was looking for. But there was something that you guys had that I didn't. And I kept asking for it, and I kept asking, and you all told me that I need to slow down and be quiet and listen, and you'll hear God speak to you. I wasn't hearing God speak to me. I'm ADD, I'm dyslexic, I'm all over the place. You know, look, there goes a squirrel. It's just, that's how it is, and I can't hardly get through the Bible, but I read the Bible once a year, the whole thing. So I went to M6, and I'm sitting there, and I'm enjoying this incredible meal, and I'm hearing this word, the journey, keep popping up all, at all these tables as I'm walking around, journey, journey, journey. And I'm hearing guys telling their friends, my wife doesn't know. I'm not the same person anymore. She can't understand what happened to me. I found, I found Christ. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that really got me to pay attention. I was like, oh, oh maybe this is what I'm missing. Maybe this is how I'm going to hear Christ talked to me. I wanted that relationship. How embarrassing to get to heaven and not know Jesus. Oh, my gosh. So um, I, I, I listened, I paid attention, and I heard that the wives are so excited about their husbands. It completely changed. And that, when, when the end of the season came and I was ready to start the journey class again, I said, I'm in. And, you know, I ended up going to this thing we call solely and I heard the Lord speak to me. And he does. He speaks to us each individually yeah. differently than, than other people. And what an incredible blessing. So I'm just going to cut it short, you guys, because this makes me nervous. But um, <laughs> it does. Um, come, have a great meal with a bunch of really incredible men seeking the Lord at the same time. Come with an appetite. Bring a friend. And bring an open heart. Have a listen and come and enjoy this wonderful thing called M6. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Good job. Hey, real quick. Yeah, thanks, Rick, by the way. Um, also, M6. So the first M6 of the season has been postponed a week. So we meet the first Monday, typically, of the month out at Thousand Hills Ranch in Pismo Beach. And um, apparently it's second Monday. Thank you. We're getting renov the, the Thousand Hills Ranch is being renovated uh, so that it can seat, I think, 500 people. Uh, so we've been averaging, I bet, over 300 people, don't you think? 250 About 250? Plus. Okay, 250 plus. And so they're going to double the capacity out there and really make, make room. So, Doug, tell us about your experience with the journey groups. 
Well, I want to uh, tell, say to Jim, uh, standing up here, he always says when he sings and he looks out how excited he gets, and it is. It's yeah. amazing to look out at everybody and yeah. really moving. Um, secondly, the, uh, the second song today was perfect for me as Awaken My Soul. Um, that's, what, that's what Journey did for me. I always been a believer, um, but going through this journey, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's personal. It's a personal, um, personal relationship between you and Jesus. And, and I, didn't, I didn't get that at first until I, until I went through this journey group. And that's what awakened my soul was I, I ended up uh, realizing that I needed to have a personal relationship, me, not anybody else, just me and Jesus. And once that happened, man, things changed. Things were just changing. And, and I remember the exact moment it happened. It happened at M24 out of Thousand Hills Ranch. Uh, it, it just, I just never, I'll never forget it, obviously. But uh, when, I, when, I, when I was able to get that, that movement of Jesus in my heart, I knew. And I know everybody's heard this before. 99% doesn't work. It's not it. I know it sounds trivial what it is, but you got to be 100% in. It just, once you're 100% in, you'll know it. You know, and you may know it, you may already be there, but if you're, if you're not and there's something tugging at you, that's, that's part of that, that 1% or 2% you need to get. And I had the same thing happen to me as Rick. It, my wife was, uh, when I came home from Soli, she wanted to know what happened there. Because <laughs> I just came back a different, a different person in a good way. Um, and I work with a gentleman real quick. I work with a gentleman for over 20, 25 years I've known him. And one day he pulled me aside and he said, what's wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean, what's wrong with you? He goes, there's something different. You know, you, you have a whole different outlook and a different, just something different. And so I've been able to share with him and, and other people. Um, the other thing, it, 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 it's helped me to be more bold about, uh, about Jesus and sharing with people that I was always cautious about before. I don't know why, but I'm not anymore. Um, we're, a lot of you know, we're involved in uh, vintage trailer. Uh, we do a lot of vintage trailer shows. That's why we miss time here and there. And I, my wife and I, we, we've come to the conclusion in this last year, that's kind of a, a mission field for us to be able to, um, to spread the word of Jesus to, to, uh, um, to these people that they don't know them or we're going you know, they're asking, they're starting to ask questions. And that's what the other thing that, that the journey helped me understand is when that opportunity comes and someone asks you a question, that's open door. You yeah. got it. You, you got to jump on it right then. You can't say, I'll talk to you later. I mean, if it's a matter of taking time and whatever, that's what I learned from it. And uh, it just changed my life, you know. And, and all I can say is, is that if you are looking... If you're looking for a study um, of following Jesus, the, 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 this personal abandonment, absolute trust, all these things, that's what you're going to learn and that's what you're going to follow. And uh, I missed that for a long time in my life. I, I've always been a believer. But once I, once I crossed that bridge and I realized it, man, it's like all in. There's, you can't, can't do anything about it. Awesome. Thanks, and the God. other thing is... Uh, after going, I know we weren't here last week, and we went to Israel with the group. And one thing that, that people that haven't been there and here, you have to understand, something that really hit me was how free we are here to talk about Jesus openly, anywhere, anytime. And, and they don't have that option. They just don't in some areas. And, uh, boy, it was really moving to me when I re it really hit me, like, really hit me hard. So, so um my name's Doug Owen, and I approve this message. <laughs> that was funny. So Doug talked about M24. There's a lot of M's. Uh, M24 is a 24-hour men's retreat out at Thousand Hills Ranch. Um, so for 24 hours, guys gather, camp out, and uh, just hear amazing speakers and pray together, hear testimony and worship together and eat great food together. Um, Rick talked about Soli. Soli is a 
retreat that happens uh, more in the Southern California area, but men from this area go. Uh, I'm going uh, in March. There's, uh, it happens three times a year. So there's a lot of things happening. The journey groups happen uh, for, uh, they happen weekly for about nine months out of the year. I think that's the number. And um, you gather, and, and, and Influencers is blowing up in the region. Uh, it, Influencers is a worldwide uh, ministry, a movement, but it's growing here on the Central Coast more than any other part of the world. And so God's really doing some profound things. There are currently 20 journey groups from Pastor Robles to Santa Barbara, and um, literally hundreds and hundreds of men are gathering weekly to grow, to go through a discipleship process, and, and amazing things are happening. There are five journey groups happening here at Harvest, so Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. There's a couple of groups happening on Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m., then Thursday morning, 6 a.m., and Friday morning, 6 a.m., and uh, so if you haven't checked out, out any of those, they actually start next week, so check your calendar for that and plan to be a part of something next week. Um, so the first week, just show up. You're not, we're not asking you to sign up for nine months. We're just saying, hey, show up and see if the Lord draws you by his spirit, if this feels like the next step for you as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So next week, show up, just get the introduction, and then you'll have a chance to make your decision about the 2020 journey after that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I, I just love it when men and women and young people are investing their lives um, in this thing that, that is called Christianity. It's called discipleship. I'm so grateful for opportunities that we have at the church, and Ron's got Bible school stuff, and we've got home group stuff. There's all kinds of stuff going on, so get plugged in. How many have heard of Nick Wallenda? Probably didn't pronounce that right. Nick Wallenda? Wallenda. So I have. You have heard of Nick Wallenda. <laughs> so he's a crazy guy, right? Nick Walinda is a crazy tightrope walker, and uh, he's apparently gone across Niagara Falls. He's gone across a portion of the Grand Canyon. He is uh, looking, I think, in New York City, going from one big skyscraper to another big skyscraper. Um, he has plans to go over a, an active volcano upon a tightrope, you know, like uh, I, I've read every, you know, I read it's three quarter inches to two inches, but even if it's five inches or whatever, <laughs> what if it's two feet wide, right? I mean, no thanks. <laughs> he is a crazy, crazy man. Apparently he's seven gen seventh generation tightrope walker. His granddad died somewhere falling off uh, to his death. And he well, he, it just continues. He's a crazy man. Some would say that uh, what he does for a living is absolutely foolish, right? I mean, there's got to be a better way to make a living. I, I, apparently, he makes about a half a million dollars for every feat, for every... It's not enough money. <laughs> it's not enough money. He's a, he's a crazy man. But people do crazy stuff all the time. I'll see if I can butcher this name. Alex Honold. You ever heard of that guy? Okay, so he's a free climber. So he most recently free climbed without harness, without rope, in Yosemite, El Capitan. 3,000 feet of granite face, he free climbs without any help. So one misstep traversing the line or climbing 3,000 feet. One misstep, and you're done. Your journey is over. It's the end of your day. <laughs> it's the end of your life. There, there's, there's probably a better way to live than to be that on the edge. I was with my grandsons yesterday. We were watching them overnight, and then during the day... And uh, we went down to this park, and uh, on the edge of the park is the Black Lake Swamp area. And so my grandson, he said, hey, can I go to that log? He's like, he's, he's trying to figure out how far he can go before he's in trouble. Not with me, but just with the terrain, right? So 
I said, yeah, you can go to that log. Well, and his, the log was about that big, and he didn't just go to the log. He stepped on the log, um, more like a twig, and it began to, the, the, the ground gave way under him, and he kind of back. I said, hey, be careful. You're going to fall. He said, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. At his young age, he's trying to figure out what he can and what he cannot do. He's trying to figure out the boundaries for life. And so I'm trying to help him figure out those boundaries for life. Hey, don't go so close to the edge. Now, he wasn't going to fall into the Grand Canyon, but he was going to possibly topple into some maybe some poison oak and some stickers and get himself messed up that way. And and he was just he was just so interested in what was down there because it was unknown. He wanted to get not just right up to it, but he wanted to get down into it and get as close as possible without getting himself in trouble. I titled today's message, Choosing the Path of Wisdom. Last week's message was Choose Your Path, and we talked about wisdom. This week I'm just saying, hey, choose the path of wisdom. Choose the path of wisdom. I'm asking you to choose. I'm asking you to choose the path of wisdom. We have a choice in life, how we will live our lives. Will we live on a tightrope with any mistake bringing an end to our lives, or will we choose a path of wisdom? You can choose a lot of different paths where you can make mistakes and recover. Um, You know, you're you're a carpenter, you frame a wall, you you frame it wrong, well, you just, you, you reframe the wall, right? Your life isn't over, uh, as a pastor, if I preach a bad message or do, you know, give a bad teaching, well, I can recover. I'll teach a better message next week, right? There's recovery built into the path. The enemy wants to take us down a path of destruction so where we're so close to the, the edge, on the wire, on the 3,000-foot granite face that if we misstep or misgrab, it's all over. He's come that, uh, Jesus came that we might have life. Jesus came to bring about death to our very lives. So my, my pleading with you this morning is that you would choose the path of wisdom. If you do choose this path, we need to answer a couple questions. First question, where do we find this wisdom that is being talked about. Where is this wisdom found? And, and then what does the path of wisdom look like? So where do we find it, and what does it actually look like as we walk it out? So where do we find wisdom? And in the Bible, in the book of Job, Job addresses this question. He addressed this question 2,000 years, roughly, before the time of Christ. So this is a question that has been pondered and considered and asked for thousands of years. And Job, in Job 28, addresses this question. In Job 28, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, says, People know where to mine silver and how to refine gold. They know where to dig from the earth and how to smelt copper from rock, dropping down to verse 10 in Job 28, they, they cut tunnels in the rocks and uncover precious stones. They dam up the trickling streams and bring to light the hidden treasures, verse 12, but do people know where to find wisdom? So we can discover all kinds of things, locate all kinds of things, find all kinds of things, we can accomplish all kinds of things, but where, do we know where to find wisdom? But do people know where to find wisdom? Where can they find understanding? And verse 13 says, No one knows where to find it, for it is not found among the living. It is not here, says the ocean, nor is it here, says the sea. It cannot be bought with gold. It cannot be purchased with silver. So where do we find wisdom? Job 28, verses 23 through 28 says, God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found. So God alone knows where it is and knows where it can be found. For he looks throughout the whole earth and sees everything under the heavens. He decided how hard the wind should blow 
and how much rain should fall, he made the laws for the rain and laid out the path for the lightning. Then he saw wisdom, verse 27, then he saw wisdom and evaluated it. He set it in place and examined it thoroughly. And this is what he has to say to all humanity. This is what the living God has to say to all humanity. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. So if God could sit us down and talk to us about wisdom, this is what he would say. It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. And we see that written throughout the Proverbs. To forsake evil is real understanding. So the fear of the Lord produces in us the desire to honor the Lord in every area and arena of our lives. Without that proper fear of the Lord, we will fail to honor the Lord in the areas and arenas of our lives. Proper fear of the Lord means that there are no areas or arenas of our life that God is not in charge of. Fear of the Lord says, God, you are in charge of everything. You see it all. I submit to you in all. I give you my life in its totality. These guys came up and talked about the difference their, the way their lives have been changed as they went from one way of following Jesus to another way of following Jesus, a better way, the way. Uh, guys who maybe had been in church, had been observing, but had never entered into that level of intimacy that God desires that we'd enter into, where we, whereby we, we know him and we're known by him, we love him and we're loved by him, we have this connection with him on the daily, uh, moment by moment throughout the course of our life. We just know Jesus because we're connected to Jesus. So proper fear of the Lord means that there are no areas, no arenas of our life that God is not in charge of. And as Men and now women and couples have gone through this and uh, this journey group. And I, I don't want to, journey's not the only path. The journey's a, a path that points us to Christ. Uh, there are many groups. We've got home groups going through different curriculum, different books of the Bible. We've got, a, we've got uh, Bible school classes that are doing the same thing. Anything that points us to Jesus and draws us, calls us into an intimate walk with him is what we should be pursuing and should be going after. Proper fear of the Lord means there are no areas. There are no areas or arenas in my life that God's, God is not in charge of. Simply put, fearing the Lord means honoring the Lord, period. Fearing the Lord means honoring the Lord. So what is that path of wisdom look like whereby we honor the Lord. So when I am speaking, when I am thinking, when I am deciding, when I am resting and working, whatever I am doing or saying or thinking or deciding, I am honoring the Lord. That's the goal. So whatever it is that I do or think or say, I, I'm choosing my path is, God, by your grace, I want to honor you. So whatever it is, Lord, there's no arena or area that is outside of your influence or outside of your lordship. Everything in my life is submitted to your leadership and to your lordship. So, Lord, my commitment, this is, should be the, the prayer and the commitment of the saints of God. My, our commitment, Lord, is that we would, in whatever we do, say, think, or decide that we honor God you. We're watching a, a new series. I think it's called The Chosen. Is that what that's called? The Chosen, it's a, it's an, if you, how many have seen The Chosen? All right, so Google The Chosen. <laughs> it is soup. It, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a production of the life and ministry of Jesus as he is in the earth, calling his disciples, working miracles, speaking truth, 
Um, it's, the, it's the life and ministry of Jesus. And so we just got back from Israel. And when you go to Israel and you are, when you are in the places walking in the footsteps of Jesus, the pages of Scripture come alive to you. And so uh, similar, similarly is when you watch, for whatever reason, there's just something on this film I'll call it an anointing. There's the presence of the Lord on this film, these, this series, so that when you watch it as Jesus walks the shores of the Sea of Galilee and calls his disciples as he works miracles, there, there's something about the way that it has been produced that we're able to get a hold of it in our soul. I, I, we watched uh, three videos in one night, and I just, I'm glad my wife was on the sofa in front of me because I was on my chair back here, and I was just weeping as I watched this production because as Jesus called his disciples, I remember when Jesus called me. I remember feeling that call upon my life to come and follow Jesus, and it just brought uh, the pages of scripture to life. When Jesus uh, worked his first miracle at the wedding of Cana and he turned the water into wine, there was just something so powerful about the present, uh, the presence of the living God at work in a real life need and situation as he healed people and ministered to people, as he confronted people with wisdom. There's just something powerful that happens when we're able to watch it in a different way. We read the scripture and we love and appreciate and honor the scripture, but, there, but there's a, a new way, a new level of communication that impacts our lives when we see it on the screen and, and are able to part, participate in it that way. It is, it is powerful. And for me, it compelled me and it reminded me, it reminded me of my call and my purpose in life. And as Jesus called these rambunctious disciples and the, as they left their fishing and their tax collecting and their different uh, forms of business to follow him, it, it reminded me that this is what Jesus is, has, has come to the earth to do, to call us, to equip us so that we might follow him, whatever it is that our calling looks like and entails. There's something powerful that takes place. It's just, it's life changing. It reminds me that whatever I'm doing, Lord, whatever I'm saying, Lord, whatever I'm deciding or thinking or whatever it is that it is going on in my life, Lord, I want to honor you. Fear of the Lord means my life isn't broken up into compartments and I'm honoring the Lord in this compartment, but not in this compartment. Fear of the Lord means I'm, I'm desiring by his grace to honor the Lord across the board. Some of us honor the Lord in compartments of our life, but not across the board, not in every arena of our lives. I think God wants to challenge that today. Can God challenge that, please? <laughs> Can God please have access to our lives such that he's able to challenge those areas and arenas that that he would have access so that he could speak and that we would say yes lord i'm listening yes lord i'm agreeing yes lord i'm following yes lord your will be done not mine this is lordship this is what it is to be a disciple a follower of the lord jesus christ he wants access fear of the lord means honoring the Lord. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. To, to fear the Lord means I'm, I'm afraid that if I'm not careful, I will fail to honor the Lord in all areas of my life. I'm, it, it takes me to a place of caution. Lord, I don't want to be flippant. I, I think in our culture, we are, we dismiss sin and we're flippant about our commitments and we don't honor it and exercise that honor and fear of the Lord. We, we let ourselves off the hook way too easy. To fear the Lord means I'm, actually, I'm afraid. Not, not in an unhealthy, um, abusive type of way. That's not, but my my decision by God's grace is, Lord, I want to honor you. So, Lord, I don't want to let things get away from me and, and miss the opportunity to honor you in every arena of my life. It just means, it just means we're serious about our decision. It just means we're serious about doing what God has called us 
to do. I think it was Elisha. I hope I get this story right. I, uh, Elijah puts his cloak, his mantle, transferring the ministry, the, the, the ministry that Elijah had, and he puts it on Elisha. And, and uh, Elisha, he was out with his oxen and plowing, and he killed his oxen, broke up the plow, and essentially ended any opportunity to retreat to his old way of living. He decided, I I don't want a path back. I don't want to give myself an opportunity to second guess what I know that God has called me to do. And and we, we see that with the disciples as they left their fishing boats and their family and friends Matthew, as he leaves his, his, his very profitable tax collection business, he walks away from it, not giving himself a way back. The fear of the Lord, it, it just means we're serious. It's not an option on the menu of our lives, will I honor the Lord? Will I do this with my life? Will I follow him in this arena? But we're saying yes across the board. Proverbs 24, 7 through 14, verse 7. Wisdom is, wisdom is too lofty for fools. Among leaders at the city gate, they have nothing to say. A comparison in Scripture, the wise and the foolish. A fool has nothing of value to add to the conversation. When important decisions are being made, the foolish are excluded. Why? Because the Scripture says that wisdom is out of reach. It's too lofty for fools. Wisdom is out of reach for those who have chosen foolishness. It's not just that there are foolish people and wise people. We get to choose the path for our lives. We will choose wisdom or we will choose foolishness. We choose. A person can't choose foolishness and then expect to have wisdom when wisdom is needed. Wisdom, like foolishness, is the result of decisions made over the course of a person's life. So whether we're wise or foolish, it is the direct result of the decisions that we have made over the course of our lives. What have we decided for our lives what is our path we are choosing one of two paths the path of wisdom or the path of foolishness wisdom takes effort and investment doesn't mean that you're perfect that anybody's perfect but it it requires effort and investment we're serious about it maybe like training for a sport You're training for football. You're putting your effort and investing yourself in it. Otherwise, you're not going to play. You'll warm the bench. You just won't play. Everything in life that is worth doing requires effort and investment. Your marriage with your kids, with your grandkids, and your relationship with Jesus, and your relationship one to another, effort and investment foolishness is the result of someone who refused or refuses to make the effort and investment. So a foolish person, due to lack of anything bigger and better to focus on, stays foolish. 
Some of you are here today and you maybe feel foolish. You don't have to be foolish any longer. Some of you here used to be wise and you've stopped. You've stopped the effort and the investment. Maybe banking on past wisdom for your life. Maybe plateauing a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago. No longer putting in the effort and making the investment. This is, this is part of the reason that we talk about vision and we talk about plans, making plans for your life. Because uh, uh, a life without a vision, without plans, it, it will just kind of trickle all over the place. Um, there, there, there's no path defined and so energy, resources, time is just kind of wasted and flittered away um, in a thousand different directions. And I said this last week, the enemy's fine with whatever you do in a thousand different directions as long as your effort is not toward Christ. He doesn't care. He does not care. He just wants to distract So what does a fool do? What does that look like? Verse 8 says, A person who plans evil will get a reputation as a troublemaker. The schemes of a fool are sinful, and everyone detests a mocker. So a foolish person plans evil. Maybe it's lack of anything better to do. They just do evil things and cause trouble. Maybe it's in the gossipness, gossiping of the way they talk about someone. You know, you know, a person's life can be literally destroyed by gossip. Maybe it's what is posted on social media, just out of pure boredom and nothing else to do and nothing else to focus on. It's gossip and whatever it is, that your heart conjures up. Because without a focus on honoring the Lord and fearing the Lord, we'll fall into a thousand different paths that bring about destruction and that are harmful to others. It seems little, it seems trite, it seems nothing, but it's, it's a profound waste of your God-given gifts and talents and the time that you have in the earth. It's a profound waste when we walk throughout this life without a plan to honor him, to fear him, to walk in wisdom. You don't just walk in wisdom by accident. You walk in wisdom as you make the effort and invest your life. Foolish people fail under pressure. There's just nothing there to sustain them. And so something happens and the foolish are derailed. They, they can't keep their faith in the Lord. They can't keep their promises. They can't keep their commitments. They're completely derailed. Verse 10 says, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. Foolish living will cause a person to fail under pressure. Why? Because in order to... Be strong under pressure. You gotta, you gotta invest. You gotta commit. You gotta, you gotta work at it throughout the course of your life. It's something that God has called us to. Something of intentionality. G Jesus was super intentional when he came to the earth. His purpose was you and me to bring the gospel, to bring salvation, to bring healing to bring reconciliation, to bring you into his kingdom, to bring me into his kingdom. Strength comes as we intentionally build it over the course of our lives, as we trust the Lord, as we allow our lives to be filled, as we pursue the filling of the Holy Spirit, as we ask God to fill us with his presence and his, his, his grace and his truth, as we trust him, uh, 
as, as we decide to trust the Lord and fear the Lord throughout the course of our lives, we have this profound responsibility as godly people to live to honor the Lord and also to serve those who cannot help themselves and serve themselves. In Proverbs 24, it says, Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. In our nation, we have unjustly executed the unborn to the tune of 600,000 babies per year. And we all know this. We all know it. Uh, the number is coming down, thankfully. Every year it's coming down. In 1990, we killed 1,429,247 kids. In 1970, we have killed about 48 million kids. We have a responsibility as the church, and I have compassion if your life has been touched by abortion. My life, our family has been touched by abortion. I would venture to say that every family in the room has been touched in some way by abortion. If you've had an abortion, God's grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient, absolutely. But that doesn't change the facts that in this nation we kill roughly 600,000 babies every year. We have a responsibility to rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die, to save them as they stagger to their death. As, as we understand the fear of the Lord and out of that desire and decide to honor the Lord, that will impact our every decision. It will impact our every decision. It will impact our choices. It will impact our voting. It will impact how we live our lives. Abortion is not a, a political thing. Abortion is a moral thing that has become politicized to divide line, to cause dividing lines in our nation. It's evil. Verse 12 says, don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. We have a responsibility in our nation to honor the Lord in the way that we live to fight for the unborn, to do what is right. As we wrap up these last couple of verses, we have encouragement to choose wisdom. Verse 13, the writer says, My child, my son, eat honey, for it is good. And the honeycomb is sweet to the taste. In the same way, wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, you will have a bright future. And your hopes will not be cut short. Jesus wonderfully came, born into this world, lived in the incarnation uh, as, a, as the God-man came that we might have life abundantly. And he gives, he prescribes for us this path toward abundance, toward a life of hope and purpose and peace and joy and forgiveness. 
The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. Where does, where does wisdom come from? The Lord. From a proper understanding and posture before the Lord. As we recognize him as king, as savior, as Lord, as leader, and as we kneel before him and submit our lives to him, we begin to walk in the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the result of our personal decision to fear the Lord. So what does that path look like? As I decide to fear the Lord, to honor the Lord in every arena, when I'm speaking, when I'm thinking, when I am deciding, when I am resting, when I am working, whatever I am doing or saying or thinking or deciding, I am honoring the Lord. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. With your gifts and talents, whatever it is that God has called you to or invited you into, however much, however much time you have here in the earth, you have a decision. You have a decision to discover what it means to fear and honor the Lord and to walk in that. It's called lordship. It's called discipleship. It's what Jesus started out with 2,000 years ago as he walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee, as he walked the cities of Jerusalem, the, the, the streets of the city of Jerusalem. He, he called people. He's calling us, and the calling hasn't changed. What we do with that call. We're going to worship some more. I'm going to invite the worship team forward, and, um, and we're going to collect the offering, and we're going to wrap up this message with just some praise and some and some time to reflect on what has been said and, and the challenge that is before us. And uh, we have this, this choice before us. What will we choose? I'm asking that you would choose wisdom, that you would choose this path of wisdom. Let's go ahead and stand up. And the ushers are going to go ahead and collect the offering. And we're going to worship some more. And so, Lord, as we give of our tithes and offerings, worshiping you in that way. And as we sing, worshiping you in that way. As we stand before you and lift up holy hands, worshiping you that way. As we give ourselves fully to you, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. God, we just we, we give you permission and give you our lives once again. Uh, thankful, God, for the opportunity. Thankful for your mercy and your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, for those who need a, a refreshing touch of your mercy, I pray that you would smile on their souls today. God, they would feel refreshed in their souls and in their bodies and in their hearts and in their minds. God, they would just feel your presence. That they would feel the, the grace and the goodness of the living God upon their lives. And God, for those who are struggling today, I, I pray that your grace would rest upon them. Those, uh, those struggling to make wise choices and choose the right path, Lord, I, I pray that you would grace them with your presence and fill them with your word and your spirit, r reminding them, reminding us of truth for the decisions that are before us. God, for those who are lamenting past decisions, past mistakes, past sin, Lord, I, I, I pray, God, that you would... God, that there would, that you, there would just be a, a fresh washing, like uh, coming up out of the waters of baptism, there would just be this refreshing uh, grace washing over every part of our bodies, inside and out, Lord. Your grace is sufficient. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us. So God, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.